So then, let's bring this back to how high carbohydrate diets, typically promoted by dietitians, can contribute to obesity. Dietitians typically preach from the Australian Dietary Guidelines, which endorse high carbohydrate diets. Our current dietary guidelines recommend we obtain 45 to 65% of our energy from carbs. And carbohydrates stimulate the release of insulin, much more than an equivalent amount of fat or protein. And this insulin can be fattening. Adipose tissue is highly vascularized, each adipocyte being in close proximity to the circulation. The two main substrates for adipocytes are glucose and free fatty acids, and these can both arise from high-carb diets. First of all, complex carbohydrates are quite literally polymers of glucose molecules, which after digestion find their way into the circulation. Secondly, excess dietary carbohydrate can be directly converted into fatty acids via the process of de novo lipogenesis. This graph is from an overfeeding study where subjects consumed carbohydrate in excess of their actual need. And despite consuming excessive carbohydrates, their rate of glucose metabolism was relatively constant, busting the myth that you can stimulate your metabolism simply by eating regularly or more. Initially, in the first few days, much of this excess carbohydrate was able to be stored in the form of glycogen. But as the glycogen stores filled up, the excess glucose began to get turned into fat. As doctors, you might know this fat by another name, as triglycerides. In actual fact, experimental research shows that feeding carbohydrate increases the saturated fat level in our blood much more than eating the saturated fat itself. So there we have it. Carbohydrates not only stimulate the release of insulin, they also elevate the levels of glucose and fat in the circulation. Let's now take a look at the biochemistry. Let's start by looking at circulating triglycerides. In their complete form, triglycerides are unable to enter the fat cell. Rather, they need to be cleaved by the enzyme lipoprotein lipase into glycerol and three fatty acids. An enzyme which just so happens to be stimulated by insulin. The fatty acids that are then able to diffuse into the fat cells. Insulin also activates GLUT4 transporters, which allows glucose to enter fat cells, whereupon it may be converted into glycerol. Glycerol and free fatty acids can then combine into the storage form of fat, triglyceride. Insulin's not done yet, though. Not only does it put triglycerides into fat cells, it also prevents their leaving. To leave the fat cell, the triglyceride molecule must again be cleaved, this time by an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. This time, insulin has a blocking action, preventing the triglycerides from leaving to be metabolised. Perhaps now you can understand the obesogenic potential of insulin. It facilitates the storage of fatty acids and then prevents their metabolism. This is why high carbohydrate diets which stimulate the release of insulin reduce energy expenditure. The thing is, as convincing as this biochemistry evidence is, we still need experimental evidence. Professor Kara Ebling and Dr. David Lowe Ludwig were principal investigators on this study, which compared low-fat and low-carbohydrate diets in terms of their energy expenditure. After losing weight on an energy-restricted diet, estimated at 60% of their actual needs, subjects were randomly allocated to diets differing in fat and carbohydrate content, the protein content being held constant. But there was a wrinkle Researchers wanted to keep the weights of the subjects over the course of the study stable so as not to confound the findings, except the subjects on the low-carb diets stubbornly continued to lose weight. The researchers had to increase their caloric intake significantly more than the high-carb group, otherwise their weight wouldn't be stable. At the end of the day, this five-month rigorously controlled, randomised controlled trial found that the 
daily energy expenditure in the subjects on a low-carb diet was 300 kilocalories a day greater than those on a high-carb, low-fat diet. They essentially got a free lunch equivalent to an hour's bike ride daily. This study provides clarity where the calories in, calories out model of obesity does not. The composition of our diet can influence our energy balance. 